At the outset, uh, good afternoon, respected seniors, colleagues, and friends. Let me thank Dr. Mohanty sir and the organizers for the opportunity. So the brief for today's talk is patellar periprosthetic fracture. Should we leave them alone or fix them? So the scheme of my talk will be what are the predisposing factors? How do we prevent them? How do we treat them? And then we'll follow it up with an example. So amongst the extensor mechanism failures, we are going to be focusing on periprosthetic fractures here. And we have patient fractures of high obesity, BMI of more than 30, high flexion activities in males, in implant factors, it's resurface patella that fractures more, metal backs, central uh, patellar peg, large patellar buttons, and in technical factors, patellar maltracking, devascularization. So we'll be touching upon important factors amongst them. So the good news is that if you're not resurfacing your patellas, you have a 0.05% chance of having a periprosthetic patellar fractures. Uh, so that's that's good news and why is that so there's a concept of stress contouring what this means is because of difference in elasticity of modulus modulus of elasticity the retropatellar surface modulates itself on the femoral component leading to increasing point of contact on deep flexion unlike the patellar resurfacing wherein you have only two points of contact on deep flexion as is shown here Use a femoral component which has a proximal extension use distal extension of the trochlea which helps to articulate on deep flexion uh, a shorter uh, intercondylar notch is better. Have an enlarged or uh, uh, lateral flange to the patellar component that negates the lateral displacing vector. Avoid uh, using a patella design that is unfriendly. A dome patella usually modulates to some amount of maltracking as well. When we are talking of resurfacing, let's consider that the patellar cut has to be parallel to the anterior surface. So you cut more of medial side than the lateral side. If you get a symmetric cut, you have goofed it up. Uh, ensure that you have at least 15 mm of patellar bone left after the resection. Thermal necrosis is real. Always irrigate the patella while you are trying to cement it in. Temperatures can rise up to 55 to 70 degrees. There are various designs of patella buttons available, but most incriminating for fractures are the central single peg design and the metal back patella. When we talk of the blood supply, there are six main arteries that form an extra osseous ring. The superior half of the ring is anterior to the quadriceps, whereas the inferior part of the ring is posterior to the patella tendon through the fat pad. The intraosseous supply too is important and that is what is violated when we use a central single large patella button. While we are doing the arthrotomy, we have already violated some of the medial vascular structures. Exuberant lateral uh, dissection and fat pad excision can affect lateral blood circulation as well. Hence, during resurfacing, always irrigate the patella, avoid using a large central peg design, and use gentle dissection while you are exposing the patella. Patellar maltracking, one of the important reasons for fractures, we will be touching upon only a few important factors. Make sure that you have only 3 to 5 degrees of external rotation, have your fixed mindset of outliers. Ensure that the component is not too much in flexion because it can impinge. A component in an extension can entirely in extensor mechanism can be pushed anteriorly leading to increased compressive forces. Avoid uh, increased rotation of the tibial and femoral internal rotation. A valgus of more than 7 degrees can increase the Q angle therefore leading to maltracking. Lateral tightness is still real. Make sure that we try and preserve as much as possible the lateral superior genicular artery. It can cause AVN and therefore a fracture. In addition, there is also a lateral patellar osteotomy described wherein 7 to 9 mm of the lateral border of the patella is excised using a saw and subperiosteal elevation is done to ensure the lateral tissues are a little lax. This was the first series that we are coming to. It was the largest series in 2002 which also described the classification of periprosthetic patellar fractures. It took into account the extensor mechanism intactness and the stability of the patellar button. So it described type 1 fractures as extension mechanism being intact and the component being stable. Type 2 were the ones in which the extensor mechanism was disrupted and the component was either stable or loose. Type 3A was the one in which the extensor mechanism was intact but the patellar button was loose but the bone stock was more than 1 cm. Type 3B were the ones in which the patellar button was loose but with a poor remnant bone stock. It also described at 6 months what is fibrous union of a fracture line less than 2 mm and a non-union being more than 2 mm of, of gap being visible. It also ensured and this entity of asymptomatic non-unions um, in their paper. Interestingly, this also gives us a hint to the treatment plan. Type 1 fractures with intact extensor mechanism and intact button can be conserved with 6 weeks of casting. 
type 2 were the ones in which extensor disruptions were present and the component was uh, was stable or loose this entailed a repair of the extensor mechanism first then either if you have a good bone stock we can retain the patella or replace it uh, do a partial patellectomy total patellectomy or a revision type 3a in uh, the ones in which the good bone stock was present but the button was loose obviously the button was uh, needing to get a revision if you could fix it we can do that if the patella button could not be uh, revised uh, there a partial patellectomy was an option type 3b in which the patella button was loose and the bone stock was very poor uh, what is recommended is partial or total patellectomy then came this meta analysis uh, in 2007 it was 752 periprosthetic fractures that were studied they found an incidence of only 0.9 percent in non resurface patella interestingly most of the fractures were in within two years of, of the index surgery and most of them did not have a fall or a trauma they have a very high chance of infection 19.2 percent and high non immune rate of 92 percent interestingly no major extensor lags were noted in their series for example this is a patient with a displaced patella fixed but the fractures as you can see are not united on opening up you see the fracture gap then this was treated with explantation of the of the wires and a good patellectomy and a good extensor repair this is our way, very own patient uh, she was operated uh, uh, almost four years back she had a fall two years back we did a good fixation we were happy with on table uh, repair of the extensor mechanism we, we also sutured the retinaculum with heavy sutures she had a fall two years back and now she comes in the OPD just two years uh, back. What would be your plan? So this is the picture, clear case of non-union as you can see it. Uh, implants are still there. So interestingly, this is the range of motion two years after the so-called non-union. No extensor lag what, whatsoever. She's walking very well. And this is what we call asymptomatic non-unions. So take home message, analyze the face, uh, patient clinically rather than radiologically classify the fracture type trace the reason for the fracture restore the extensor mechanism that is mo most important and do not chase for bony union let's give respect to the shield of our total knees and i think this requires diligent thought thank you